And now, it's my honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, the 56th Governor of New Jersey, the Honorable Phil Murphy. <laughs> Governor Murphy, all of us at Stockton are truly honored to have you with us today. And we are especially honored to know you chose Stockton University to deliver your first commencement address as governor of the great state of New Jersey. But there's no pressure, Governor. There really is no pressure. Graduate, Governor Murphy knows a thing or two about the in-between I spoke of earlier. After putting himself through college, he too started his career from the ground floor and worked his way up to help lead a major international business. In addition, Governor Murphy has headed national and state task forces on education, served as New Jersey's sole representative on the board of the NAACP, the world's oldest civil rights organization, and of course was appointed U.S. Ambassador to Germany by former President Barack Obama. The governor has shown unwavering support for higher education and is committed to investing in New Jersey's educational future and retaining the very talented graduates seated in this room. So without further ado, please join me in giving a hearty stock and welcome to our keynote speaker, the Honorable Phil Murphy. Thank you, man. Love you, man. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let me get this off my chest, if I may. Stockton rocks. Yeah. Holy cow. <clears throat> and Atlantic City rocks. And together, it really rocks. Wow. President Kesselman, uh, as uh, Dr. Allison, uh, I had the same reaction she did. I didn't have you pegged for Kendrick Lamar, I have to admit. I had you more as a g Easy guy. Shows you what I know. Chairwoman Deininger and members of the Board of Trustees, the outstanding administrators, faculty, and staff, elected official, officials, civic leaders, a big shout out to my friend Kathy Whalen, members of clergy, assembled friends and family, proud Ospreys, and of course, the extraordinary members of the Stockton University class of 2018. <clears throat> Thank you all so much for welcoming me this morning, today. It's always good to be in Atlantic City, but it is a special treat to be in this historic building named after our friend Jim Whalen on this day of celebration. I am told that I am only the second sitting governor to ever speak at commencement at Stockton, and the first since my friend Governor Jim Florio in 1990. And so that makes this even a greater honor. Class of 2018, you have worked long and hard to get to this point. You've completed your classes, taken your final finals, and the grades are in. In just a few moments, you will receive your degrees and go from being proud students at Stockton University to proud alumni, and you have richly earned this distinction. You have also earned the celebrations and congratulations of friends and family. And yes, I'm even counting that one person you passed on campus every day and never exchanged anything beyond a quick nod. You never knew their name but you'll never forget their face. Well, even today, that guy or that gal is family. Let's take a minute to soak in this atmosphere. We are, after all, in one of the truly iconic buildings, not just in Atlantic City, but in our state. Home to the very first indoor college football game. And we are only a few blocks from the Irish pub where I'm guessing some of you just came from and where you hope to get back before your bar stool gets cold. I'm a Murphy after all. But even more, look around. We're surrounded by your family and friends. Every single one of them helped you get here. They have supported you throughout your years at Stockton 
and today are sitting with eyes filled with tears and hearts filled with pride. They are your true North Stars, and I think they all deserve a big round of applause. <laughs> Harvey said it well, today is both an end and a beginning. It's the end of the carefree days of sleeping late on a Tuesday just because it happens to be a Tuesday. And in case you are unaware, as of today, flip-flops are no longer considered appropriate footwear for every occasion. It is the beginning, honestly and truly, of this thing called adulting. And you're ready for it. There's a big world out there waiting for you to jump in. And all that is standing in the way is me. So let's get this thing going. Yeah. It is customary, perhaps even cliche, for commencement speakers to try to impart to the graduating class words of wisdom gleaned from years of personal experience. And from a cursory review of a slew of past commencement addresses, all available on YouTube, by the way, including some of my own, it appears the most popular piece of wisdom being doled out on days like this is a little bit like my friend Jim Whalen said last year, don't be afraid to fail. I'm pretty sure this was uttered at my own college commencement 39 years ago. Unfortunately, I can't tell you much about my college commencement beyond who addressed us. It was the late West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, who as fate would have it would actually become a close friend of mine later in life. I'm just very lucky he never asked me to recite anything he told us in the speech that day. And it isn't my, that my memory left me or that I had been partying the night before, which I had been. It was because my head was already swimming with the uncertainty that awaited me once I took off my robe and packed away my cap and hung that nice piece of paper on the wall and, and walked into what is cruelly referred to as the real world. As I sat among my classmates, I wondered how would I repay my college loans, questioned whether I'd ever be able to afford to go to graduate school, and I wondered what job I would take or whether I'd even be able to find a job. All of that is entirely natural, and I'm sure many of you have had those thoughts right now. But taking that first cautious yet deliberate step into the real world requires a certain courage, an appetite for risk, and ultimately, you gotta get that first job. So here was my first job, selling college textbooks at $12,500 a year to professors, many of whom took some pleasure in slamming their office doors in the face of a salesman barely older than their students. Now I might add, by the way, as of my graduation day, I did not even have yet that job. To say it was a humbling experience would be an understatement. Failure will be an ever-present companion. That's part of adulting. But giving up and walking away also means walking away from a dream. In my case, it wasn't a dream to be the next great book salesman, but the bigger dream that we all have, to make it somewhere, somehow. There were more than a few moments standing outside a freshly shut door when I questioned whether I had it in me to knock on the next one, but I stuck it out. Somehow enough doors stayed open to me that after a couple of years I had made enough money to attend graduate school. In fact, tomorrow night I'm attending my 35th graduate school reunion. I then took another risk and started as an intern at the very bottom of the food chain of business. I was competing for jobs against peers with pedigree names in business whose fathers helped them get through a door, the same door that I had to fight my way through. I was kitted for my polyester suits and my Samsonite briefcase, an inauspicious beginning to be sure, but nothing stokes the competitive fire like being told you can't make it. Two decades later, as Harvey alluded to, I was leading thousands of employees in offices around the world. I have been able to open doors that would eventually lead to my being named by President Barack Obama as the United States Ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany. 
where I would reconnect, by the way, with my dear friend, the now departed Helmut Schmidt. And two years ago, I threw caution to the wind and announced that I was running for governor of this great state when very few people knew me or even gave me a chance. I did not let the threat of failure deter me from doing what in my heart I firmly believed was the right thing to do or from saying what I believe then and still believe now are the important things that need to be said. Because of this willingness to dance with failure, I now have the honor of standing on this stage. Not bad for a kid who grew up in a working poor family, the son of a liquor store manager and a secretary, only one of whom graduated from high school. I take no victory laps in telling you about me. I tell you all this for your sake. It turns out that the evergreen commencement advice is right. Don't be afraid to fail. In fact, embrace the possibility that you will as you push to achieve your goals. It's the only way you will get over that fear. It's the only way you will ever learn all about the stuff of which you are made. And by the way, talking about risks you might take or leaps you might make is not enough. You only fail or succeed if you do. And don't take my word for it. There are plenty of examples of this truism throughout history and just as many eloquent things said on the topic by people who died long ago. Given Stockton's reputation for leadership in the environmental sciences, and I know there are a few graduates in these fields in the house, I want to cite a hero of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Making sure you're paying attention out there, folks. I want to cite a hero of mine, a man who helped usher in the conservation movement in the United States, a great American, Theodore Roosevelt. Appropriately enough, he can't make this up, in August of 1894, seven years before he became president, the Atlantic Monthly published an essay that he authored, and it was titled, The College Graduate and Public Life. This is what future President Roosevelt wrote, and I quote him. The first great lesson which the college graduate should learn is the lesson of work rather than of criticism. Criticism is necessary and useful. It is often indispensable. But it can never take the place of action or be even a poor substitute for it. It is the doer of deeds who actually counts in the battle for life." End of quote. Wow. Imagine nearly 124 years ago, Teddy Roosevelt wrote what could pass today as a blistering critique of social media. More importantly, TR, as many called him, uh, continued to call out this gap between words and action his entire life. As both governor of New York and president of the United States, he was an example of energy put to use to improve the life of the common man. He wasn't one to say big things, he did big things. And by doing so, he succeeded, and at times he failed. Even after he left the presidency in 1909, he continued to urge for action over words. In fact, in 1910, in a speech delivered, I believe, in Paris, he titled it Citizenship in a Republic. And it includes, I want to make sure you listen to this class, it includes a passage that is among, in my humble opinion, the most compelling ever uttered by an American. And I quote the president, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, of where or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds. Wow. You talk about a man who lived life consistent with his own credo. But he was right, both for his, his day and for ours. It is simply not enough to post or tweet or like and consider that as actual participation in our cultural, political, or social dialogue. In these times, perhaps more than ever in our history, we need doers of deeds, not people who take their comfort in lobbing memes from their smartphones 
you are graduating at a time of both great opportunity and great challenge. By sometime next year, just a little over a year from now, your generation, the millennial generation, will become the largest group of living Americans. I entered this world at the tail end of the baby boom, and we welcome your generation as it takes its place of leadership in our state, in our nation, and in our world. Now, I know there are some for whom that thought fills them with sheer terror. After all, each generation is tagged with a collective, oftentimes two-dimensional narrative. I know mine was. In its crassest form, yours is shorthanded as a bunch of glued-to-the-phone, selfie-taking, avocado toast-eating kids. Just to say, I don't see it that way, and neither do we see it that way. Your generation is already showing that it is ready to lead. Young people in Florida have begun a national conversation on gun safety. <laughs> multitudes, multitudes of young people in waves like we've never seen before, Republicans and Democrats alike, are putting their names on a ballot for an office. Entrepreneurs not much older than you are are building new apps and businesses which are changing the very way we live, shop, and get information. Your generation is not letting anyone tell you to sit down and wait your turn. And perhaps more than any, your generation is embracing its willingness to fail. And as you do, I urge you to also embrace your ability to bring about fundamental change in our state and in our nation. We have a saying in my family, I've got four kids under the age of 21, so please, among other things, keep me in your prayers. <laughs> we have a saying in my family that voting is necessary but not sufficient. It means that walking into that voting booth once or twice a year and making your voice heard in the direction of public policy is the very least you can do in our free society. Working to make a difference in any way will take that singular and personal action to the next step. As governor, I recently signed into law a measure to ensure every eligible New Jerseyan is automatically registered to vote. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and there's a but, that law is only as good as your ability to get out and vote and the ability, frankly, of those of us in public office to give you a reason to come out and vote. Regardless of your religion, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, your nation of origin, your political affiliation, your economic status, the mantle of leadership is inevitably falling to you. What you do with it will quite literally change the world. And I don't mean just political leadership. Each of you has now been given a specialized set of skills through which, in your own way, you could build a better society. Some of you will be teachers crafting the next generation of informed citizens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you will be nurses, therapists, and public health workers on the cutting edge of new treatments and practices that will lengthen and improve lives. Some of you will work in our criminal justice system. Yeah, yeah, CJ, CJ. Ensuring that the laws of our state and nation are fairly and justly applied. Some of you will start your own businesses and create jobs, yeah. Expanding economic opportunity and opening doors to a better life for others. And some of you will divert from the path you are currently on and enter an entirely new and unexpected, a field you don't even see coming. So whatever it is, make the most of it. Do good, and by the way, at the same time, do well. And perhaps, perhaps some of you will someday run for public office, taking your experience and expertise and putting it to work for the residents of your town or county, or maybe even the betterment of the nine million of us who proudly call this great state our home. You are all going to be doers of deeds. How far you take it is now entirely up to you. 
And maybe one day, regardless of the field you are entering, you may wind up on this stage speaking to a future class whose heads are filled with the same questions and doubts I had then and you have now. There is, this is no doubt a tumultuous time in our history, but there have been others. Trust me, I, like many of us, I grew up in the 1960s. And sadly, we saw too many of our heroes, John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., among them, taken from us before our eyes. And I pray you never see your heroes taken from you in a similar fashion. But as tumultuous as the 60s were, and in particularly 1968, uh, whose 50th uh, anniversary we honor, they led to a period of great social change. And such as it is these tumultuous times, although we, we may not recognize it admittedly at the moment, will almost certainly lead us as well to great social change. And it will be your jobs to see that change through. This is simply part of the American experiment of which we are all a part. We cannot move forward without some upheavals. One generation moves the ball of citizenship forward, there's a scrum, and then the next generation picks up the ball and carries it forward before it too must hand it off. On August 27, 1964, in this building, Robert F. Kennedy, then the Attorney General of the United States of America, addressed the delegates to the Democratic National Convention which was meeting here to renominate President Lyndon Johnson. It was his first national address since his brother, President John Kennedy, was killed nine months before. And here is what the Attorney General said on that day, right here, probably on this stage, 54 years ago, of his late brother, and I, I quote Robert Kennedy. His idea really was that this country, that this world, should be a better place when we turned it over to the next generation than when we inherited it, inherited it from the last generation." End of quote. And so I urge you to make this world better than the one that my generation and your parents handed you. Ensure that the world that you hand to your children is one that they may continue to improve upon. And heed the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who said, and again I quote him, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. So now it is time for me to conclude so you can be declared graduates of Stockton University. So you can make your way out into the world, or maybe just back down the street to the Irish pub. So you could get that job and earn a steady paycheck and make donations back to the Stockton University Alumni Fund, <laughs> President Kesselman. I want to make sure you give me credit for that. To all of you, I offer you both my congratulations and my, my thanks. I'm incredibly humbled that you chose me to continue, that you chose to have me today and chose to continue your educations right here in New Jersey. And I hope your future endeavors keep you here as part of the New Jersey family. We look forward to watching you change our world. Thank you all so much for having me a part of this today. May you forever soar like an osprey. May God bless you all. May God bless the great state of New Jersey. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you, ma'am.